My name is Lauren Davina, and this is a story time about creativity, generative AI, and the singularity. But before we get into it, I want to play a 90 second animation made in one and a half days by myself and AI. Let's hit it. Our senses awaken when a tsunami draws near. The power is great and beckons our fear. An inevitable encounter, its presence felt in the gust, our past tranquility lingers as if to adjust. It moves quickly and takes center view, a new age of progress, one to pursue. This tsunami of change will bring strength and surprise. Hold tight to your courage and open your eyes. Step into the light, embrace every rise and fall, for this is the wave of evolution and its power is here for us all. Fear not the future, for it yields untold hopes. Prepare yourself for this journey and feel the warmth of its scope. For with artificial intelligence we can now explore, unlocking potential only enhances our core. So brave the dawn and be ready to ride. Forge a path through the storm and courageously stride. Choose this new world and be transformed anew. An adventure awaits, so bravely take the plunge and pursue. So this was made in December of 2022, and there were a few pieces of AI software that enabled me to coast through the different components of character and world creation at a super fast turnaround. The first is copy. I used ChatGPT with prompts such as, AI is like a tsunami, and the love child of Jonathan Swift and Maya Angelou to create this spoken word. The second is character design. Using Midjourney, I prompted it to create a photorealistic picture shot on an old film stock of a great scientist from the 1930s, but with face tattoos. For modeling, I use Reillusion's Character Creator, which has a really awesome system enabling you to dial proportions to achieve your desired character's look. Next up in animation, I use Reillusion's iClone, which has an AI-powered lip-syncing animation called AccuLips built into it. For the environment, I use Unreal Engine's 5.3, which has integration with Reillusion's products. And lastly, to get the voiceover, I use Play.ht, where their VO named Oscar, who's a gritty British grandfather type, literally inspired the whole character in the project. But here's the crazy part. When I tried doing the same thing in October of 2022, there was no ChatGPT, Midjourney was still on version 4, which was still pretty amorphous, and Play.htaivo was, for lack of a better way of saying it, kind of crappy. In just two months, AI tech went from not existing to becoming creative tools which are capable of traveling beyond our wild imaginations, and very, very quickly. And this all goes without saying, Everything I tell you in the next few minutes is going to be totally irrelevant very soon. And the reason it'll be irrelevant is because today and tomorrow and the next day, there will be new tools and new tech. From here on out, expect that everything you know, everything you do will be exponentially bigger and more powerful and more knowledgeable and more capable than the thing before it by orders of magnitude. And the reason for this is because of a beautiful thing called the singularity. Now, I need to pause here. I think it's really important to talk about how we've got here and to gander upon where we go from here. In doing this, I think it'll help us form a more complete picture as to how I've been using AI and potentially how you could probably work it into your pipeline as well. And that means talking about the singularity, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart. What is the singularity? First, story time. In 1990, when I was a really little girl, a book came out. It was called The Age of Spiritual Machines, and it was written by a computer scientist named Ray Kurzweil. This book discusses the history of artificial intelligence and forecast future developments. Now, in 1990, I'm like a kid, so I'm not the one that's reading this book. But my dad, who was this prolific artist and architect and futurist, was really getting into the work of Ray Kurzweil. Now, I loved my father. So if he was reading Kurzweil's nonfiction work on futurism, transhumanism and AI, nanotechnology and life expansion, I was right behind him. So let's get one thing straight. Kurzweil is not just a computer scientist or inventor, 
He's a straight baddie. This guy invents a reading machine so that blind people can hear a computer read back words to them. And how did he do this? Well, he had to create a new technology called text-to-speech. Sound familiar? Pretty much Kurzweil is the grandfather of Alexa and Siri. So you get it, straight legend. Anywho, in 2005, he comes out with a book called The Singularity is Near. He borrowed the term the singularity from a science fiction writer named Werner Vinge. The term singularity means a black hole, and it's meant to imply the event of a horizon of a black hole beyond which we cannot see or predict. But here's the catch. Kurzweil is not a science fiction writer. He's a straight up computer scientist. So his reimagining of Vinge's ideas are actually grounded in reality, our reality. Kurzweil describes his law of accelerating returns, which predicts an exponential increase in technologies like computers, genetics, nanotechnology, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Once the singularity has been reached, Kurzweil says the machine intelligence will be infinitely more powerful than all intelligence combined. Afterwards, he predicts that intelligence will radiate outward from the planet until it saturates the universe. This singularity is also a point at which machines intelligence and human intelligence would merge. His words were, I set the date for the singularity, representing a profound and disruptive transformation in human capability as 2045. And this is all really crazy because I think for most of us, we thought the future would look like, you know, robots first and then maybe, maybe artificial general intelligence would sort of like make its way into our lives. Like we all thought it was gonna be like data from Star Trek or Robbie the Robot or how. But outside of the amazing work done at Boston Dynamics, robots are still robotic. We haven't perfectly synthesized skin. And if you saw a robot today, it doesn't look very human yet. But instead, AI came for creativity first which seems unthinkable because in order to be creative, you have to be clever and form relationships and have experiences in the world that lead you to the conclusions creatively that make things meaningful and divine. You have to be able to understand what it's like to sit in sun or to feel warmth or to feel cold or to feel love or to be heartbroken. You have to understand why we find dogs and cats who are like weird little fluffy creatures wandering around cute or why we create memes and unilaterally feel that they're funny. But here is where we have to return to our good old friend Ray K because He's the one that's predicting all of this, right? Ray K is obviously the OG AI guy. TLDR, Ray K is not surprised that we have discovered generative AI and are suddenly thrust into the future. After all, him and his homies have been doing this for decades. His only real revision is that 2045 seems a little too far off in the future. But here is something that's very surprising to them, very interesting to them, but scary as hell for the rest of us. Let's say we have a metaphorical black box. Let's say you feed it all the data from Wikipedia, social media, and the internet. Of course you'd expect the output to be really awesome. But what's sort of spooky is that once all this data goes into the black box and comes back out after having been processed by like code magic, the scientists they don't really know what's going on inside this black box. Let's use creativity as an example with programs such as Midjourney, DALI, Stable Diffusion, ChatGPT. Not only can it represent the visualness of the input, the output has taste. Like taste can be learned, sure. And that makes sense because the LLMs or large language training models have been trained on like essentially all of humanity's tastes. So like, duh, of course it has taste. It's being trained on things we like for like centuries and centuries. It knows that we like well at photography or memes. All of this is somewhat unremarkable because it's been trained on like the collective experience of humanity. But with the scientists and the linguists and everybody who's touched these large language training models or LLMs and the AI don't understand is, why is it so good? We know what it's doing, we know how it's getting to the conclusions it's getting to, but we don't understand why it's so good. Never fear, I know this sounds all very doom and gloom, I know it sounds very 2001 Space Odyssey, and quite frankly, my dear, it should, but it's also the most exciting thing ever. Anyway, all of this is kind of coming to a head because we're clearly hitting the part of the Ray Kurzweil curve that is going straight the bug up, which is why everything I've said up until now 
will be obsolete in the next five days or five minutes. Is it scary? Yes. Is it gonna solve cancer and childhood leukemia? Yeah. Will it replace people and create massive swaths of unemployment that will potentially destroy humanity? But let's look back at history to see how humanity has handled grand movements and innovation. The Industrial Revolution was really problematic in some ways for humanity. It put a lot of people out of work. But this wasn't like you lost a job you love. These jobs were horrible. They required humans, fleshy humans, to be in factories with nauseous chemicals and dangerous machinery. But as we humans do, we evolved and we found better, more safe, more innovative ways to use our complex brain machines. What I'm saying is, this is the next step for us. Like, we can all agree that typing at this point is pretty lame. Sitting in front of these computers, although we're safer, does not make use of our physical bodies. And it's going to be a renaissance. Like we should be excited for everything. We may very well likely be a part of humanity that is the final piece. We're sort of in that weird, awkward teenage phase. There is going to be likely a massive war on chips so that every country on the planet can duke it out to see who can control the earth and the universe. But guess what's also coming? VR, seamless integration of virtual lands in our own eyeballs. AR, friends and loved ones across the world living like holograms in our living rooms. We're gonna be building a future that is so unimaginable because it is so beautiful and so big and so unknown. Pardon my hyperbole. I just can't help but spread the contagion of positivity because how lucky are we? I also want to address something I've been seeing a lot on my socials, which is a real fear and uncertainty. Illustrators and concept artists are feeling a sense of utter hopelessness, but this is just temporary because once everything is settled, we'll find ourselves much like painters found themselves when photography was invented. Photography, after all, inspired new artistic movements. Drawing and painting and conceptual thinking and critical thought, these are invaluable pieces of the human experience. New and awesome creative opportunities you can't imagine will spring from what feels like a dystopian world. Instead of being a cog in the machine, you will be the machine but a better one. What I'm saying is you will be the author of your own creative path. And now back to the creative perspective and what I'm doing with it. Since Mid Journey and Dolly and Stable Diffusion and ChatGPT and many others have emerged, I mean, my personal life has taken terms I never even dreamt of. How am I using it? Mostly today like everybody else to explore my mind quickly. Specifically, I've used it to create bespoke poetry in an animation I was able to make in two days. And I also see it as sort of a tsunami. It's like you can see it in the horizon, you're like, everybody, hey, check it out. Like, grab your surfboards, let's go. I used AI to brand an internal initiative for Partisan. At the time, I was using Midjourney 3, and it just like would not make a snail. So I decided to draw the snails. But I was unhappy with my snail drawings. They just seemed super soft and bland and a great colleague of mine recommended that I feed my snail drawings into Midjourney. And this was before the blend feature was introduced, so this was exciting territory. Sure enough, I plugged my snail drawings in, along with other various camera lensing and pencil techniques, along with styles similar to The Rabbit's Wedding or Roll Doll or Shel Silverstein, and voila, snail masterpieces. Weird, but cool. Note, never use just one illustrator. If you use one illustrator, it will jack that illustrator style. If you use 10 illustrators, it'll create a computational mess. And if you blend them with your original drawings, it'll make something pretty unique. The crazy thing about AI as well is that it starts to look a lot like your own art. The second thing I did with it was something I never thought I'd ever think about doing ever. I am like a straight artist. I like went to RISD and happened to fall into this world of advertising and animation. And I love it because I love finding purposeful, meaningful ways to apply art, design, and craft. But I had some really great clients come to me and ask me if I could work with them and requested that I send them a contract and I don't know how to write a contract. I can barely even file taxes. So I worked with ChatGPT and of course it built me an extremely professional contract. It's a secure way to establish expectations and boundaries. Now, I'm not saying that this is anything to replace lawyers. Of course you need legal counsel if you're doing anything that requires more things. The other thing I asked it to help me do was to define a clear pay scale. Like, 
I legit hate talking about money. I always have, I just wanna create art. But money is important for a few reasons, like a girl's gotta eat. But more importantly, it sets a precedent. If I know my value, I need to be paid my value so that those that come after me get paid their value as well. Which begs the question, how do I know my value? Well, that's a really good question, Lauren. Why don't you ask ChatGPT? And while you're at it, ask it to add some inflation because that's where we are now too. It's total transparency. You can literally show your client the process. This is so odd for someone that's creative that's just never touched a budget in their lives. It offered an idea that I had never thought about to offer to my clients, which was to create three tiers, a low tier, a mid tier, and a high tier. From there, I was able to ask it to specify what each of these tiers sort of meant for the client, even to the point of specifying how many revisions they get per tier. It will help us to clarify expectations and get on the same page so that collaboration is less about this weird money burden and more about this exciting creative process. It's this fear that artists always have that we get to do what we love, so we shouldn't be paid more than that because we're already doing something we love. But really, it's all about value creation. And ChatGPT helps remind us that that's basically all it is. And more importantly, what it really enabled me to do was start my own studio. And I don't mean start my own studio in the sense that I wanna compete with other studios. I mean, I was making so much work, I had no place to put it. Even though my family are all architects and artists and business people, I never really felt like I had the right to do this because I was never an expert in the area of money. But what I really wanna do is be able to hire like minds to work with me. In this way, we just get to collaborate in this extremely transparent, equal playing field. The AI has helped me create new aesthetics that I think are really wonderful springboards to innovate on new design. It also helped me create the design for the character I needed to build for the two-day turnaround of the AI poetry character spot but you love the creative process, Lauren. Sure, I love it when I get to oil paint or make weird looking characters on my own, but do I love the tedium of revisions or design requests I strongly disagree with or animating frame by frame? No, and of course, I gotta address the controversy. I don't think AI should be sampling from a single artist style or body of work. But the truth is, that's not really what it's doing. Think of the black box like a brain. There's inputs, there's outputs. The brain does a whole lot of computing in between, and it's not singularly representing one person's work or style. But we all do have a social responsibility to like not jack each other's styles off. So please, do not put in, in the style of. It's just not the right thing to do. Generative AI helps me and others work faster, more confidently, and more collaboratively. The thing is, AI isn't going to build this for us. We're going to be building with AI. This will mean that people have jobs they never thought were possible. Jobs that bring more meaning and more purpose and more excitement to their lives. Things always get better. Nothing I've said is going to be relevant soon because you're just here for a tiny little blip of time on this super, super small shred of the timeline of humanity. Why not use tools that help you enjoy and discover more? That's really the entire essence of our existence. And then once we're done here, we get off this timeline, we leave it for the next people to enjoy, and who knows where the curve goes.